So moving on to liberalism. What do I mean when I say liberalism here in the 19th century? Do I mean Democrats? No, what do I mean? Yeah, a classical liberal, right. And then what influenced that set of thoughts? Yeah, the Enlightenment thoughts. So this is going to be, it's going to change across the 19th century, which we'll discuss. It goes from one view to two views, which we'll talk about. But this is basically, again, don't confuse this with contemporary, like present day liberals and conservatives. These are uh, classical liberals for the most part. Um, so these are uh, proponents, supporters, advocators of, of Enlightenment ideals. Um, so well, let's really quickly remind us what those things actually are. You mentioned one, equal opportunity. Okay, so equal opportunity. And what does equal opportunity actually mean, by the way? What you got? Yep. Me? Yes. It means it doesn't matter like your social class or anything, like anyone can do any job or like have any education. Yeah, or at least they, they deserve the opportunity to, to try it. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't mean necessarily anybody can do anything, but it does mean that anyone should have the opportunity to try it. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, what else uh, is this about? Uh, or maybe you can tell me more about this equal opportunity thing. Either one. I was going to say separation of powers or having more of the common people in the government. What powers did you say? Separation of power. Oh, separation of power. Is it subracial? I was like, what? I don't know what that means. Yeah, um, so how can we phrase this? Uh, democracy, certainly. I would say democracy uh, and uh, limited government, right? So limited, limited government. Not as in it's gone, but there are some checks on it, like the separation of powers, right? We can't have monarchs running wild doing whatever they want to do. Yeah, and now I think I'll go to the equal opportunity here. So we got a political opportunity, uh, so I can vote, right, suffrage rights, I can run for office. Economic, I shouldn't be limited to property rights just because I'm a noble or something like that should be open to everybody. Uh, and then increasingly social rights too, uh, where uh, across time, certainly not at the beginning of the 19th century, but across time that people, uh, men and women can kind of do as they please and there, there shouldn't be these enforced norms on like, what women can and can't do, and what men uh, can and can't do. All right. Yeah, what else we got? Natural rights. Natural rights, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Uh, slash protection of natural rights. And that goes partly with uh, equality, too, right? Seeing all humans as born with these rights and, and equal capabilities. All right. What having constitution? Yeah, I go, I go limited government. Constitutions are definitely a part of that. Breaking economic barriers. Breaking economic barriers. I would say that goes with the uh, equal opportunity, but you're totally right. All right. I think the one thing I want to add to this that you guys didn't touch on, it's, it's actually a little bit more scientific revolution, but it's still applicable, uh, is using, uh, using or forming uh, logical, reason-based institutions. So they want things to be as effective as possible, right? They don't just randomly do things because, you know, God said to do it, or the Bible said to do it, or, you know, they've always done it this way, or because of magic or faith or revelation, any of that stuff. They want it to be based on what actually works. Whoops. What actually works, right? Test it, observe it, see if it works. If it doesn't, then change it. If it does work, great. Keep it, make it better. That's what they want to do. All right. Um, and I would add... But there's a goal. The goal is progress with a capital P. And that means uh, decrease suffering and increase what? Happiness? Prosperity. Prosperity or flourishing, right? Right. Like not dying. Not having a 50% chance of dying before you reach age five. That's a great one. Not having a 20 or 25% chance of a mother dying giving birth. That's a good one to get rid of. You know, things like that. Okay. So. They're going to use these tenets uh, and try to apply them to society. So let's see how they start out, roughly speaking, in the uh, early, yeah, early 19th century. So there's a guy, an Englishman, who comes up with a political view or philosophy who is largely considered the father of classical liberalism. Who is he and what's the philosophy? Uh, yeah. Utilitarianism. Okay, cool. 
John Stuart Mill, uh, and he was a, uh, an adherent or believer in uh, utilitarianism. Okay, that's his uh, kind of philosophy. And again, he's kind of the, the father of classical liberalism. All right, you want to explain the utilitarianism? Yeah, it's um, whatever makes the most people happy is the best for the nation. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I don't think everyone would agree with that exact statement. I mean, that's what he believed. But uh, it's definitely better than living life for the uh, you know privileged nobility and kings, and we all kind of have to toil and do whatever they want uh, because they're smarter or blessed by God or whatever you know explanation they have for that. So, if I'm John Stuart Mill and I look at the England in this case in the early 1800s, what am I going to see? as far as the most people being the most happy? Is that, is that being accomplished? And if not, how is it not being accomplished? Women uh, not having suffered. Okay, yeah, women have very few social and political rights or economic rights, absolutely. What else? Or working conditions. Okay, yeah, working conditions are poor, all right. What else uh, might I see? Uh, mistreatment of the working class. Yeah, okay, that goes to the poor working conditions. Um, I w the thing I would, I would actually say for both of those is, can either of those groups go out and change things for the better for themselves? No, no they can't. What can't they do for the most part? Uh, yeah, okay, can't do strikes or unions, but for the most part, they can't even vote either. Guys, you gotta, don't forget that fact. Even the working class men, most of them could not vote, so they didn't have any say. Who goes to the, the House of Commons and makes, law, makes laws? Women uh, have no uh, vote so far as I know either, so neither one of them have a political voice. So. What do you think his solution is to making these large groups of people, women, which are half of the uh, population, and the working class, which are more than half of it, uh, what's his solution to making them happier? Legalizing unions and strikes. Okay, but to do that, I'd have to do what? Yes, okay, so he actually offers, not offers, uh, advocates universal suffrage, which is everyone, men, women of all classes. The, no one is ready for that in the world yet, not even super progressive England. Uh, but they are going to try to expand suffrage to a greater uh, swath of people, all right? So consider the fact that um, in the early 19th century, the amount of voters I had that were working class and female were almost none. So uh, female voters, nope. And then working class voters, uh, few to zero. Few to none, depending on my area. Okay, so he wants to change that. Uh, how does he think that changing, giving women uh, or working class people to vote, and, and women aren't gonna get it for quite a while, so we'll just talk about working class men for right now. How does, even though he does advocate female suffrage, uh, when, uh, how would giving working class men the vote help anything? What would it do? Okay, yeah, all right. So I at least get working class opinions in parliament in the, in the case of England, okay. It's ultimately doing what he believes, uh, making the most among people happy. As but I'm talking about how. How does giving working class people to vote do that? Uh, because now they can change uh, the issues they currently have. How? Uh, by putting in their vote against a certain middle class. There you go, okay. So you're talking constituents. Constituents are the people that vote for the representatives, all right? So yes. If I have a bunch of working class constituents, are they going to vote for some super pro middle class uh, representative? No. no, they're going to vote for people that are at least middle road, if not outright support working class people. All right, so that's really going to change dynamics uh, right there. Uh, so I'd say it's a combination of what you both said. And also, too, potentially they could afford it, which not many could. They could even run for office themselves and get a seat into parliament. All right, uh, so yeah, the reason why he wants to do this, he's going to, uh, of course, advocate. Uh, universal suffrage, won't get that for a long time, but uh, to enable working class and uh, female constituents. And that's actually a big deal. If I have no working class people in, uh, in, in, in the House of Commons, and now all of a sudden working class people can vote people in, 
whether it's running themselves or voting for middle class people that support them, that's really going to change things because now I have representatives putting forth uh, laws and bills that support the working class, like you know, uh, the, the, the ones we talked about that are forthcoming, like the uh, uh, Mines Act, Factory Act, 10 Hours Act. The fact that those were even put forward was because working class people are going to have the vote, which we'll talk about here in a minute. All right. Um, so it forces uh, laws to be proposed for the working class, and the middle class can't just pass whatever they want because they have to consider the votes of those working class people. So they got to compromise. All right. So it means that it's not just a middle class monopoly on pro business, uh, no workers. Now they're going to have to be at least in the middle, uh, give working class something as opposed to nothing. All right. And that's the idea behind this. So the reason why we get the term classical liberalism is. Um, this is where someone supports maximum free freedom, max freedom or liberty for uh, political life and economic life. So they want very little government intervention. Uh, they want you to be able to do whatever you want with your businesses without many tariffs or taxes or regulations, but they also want you to be able to vote for uh, and do whatever you want to do in society, as long as you're not like killing and harming other people, essentially. That's what a classical liberal is. That's what a modern day libertarian is, if you guys have ever heard of that term. I don't mean the party, the United States party. People that are libertarian generally believe I shouldn't have any social or political restrictions on what I can do, so I can do whatever I want, have tattoos and do this and drink this and say this or use this drug or not use this drug, whatever it might be. Uh, and then they also believe in economic freedom where they don't want the government saying what they can and can't do with their businesses and or their money. That's a modern day libertarian. All right. So conservatives tend to favor the economic freedom part and then they're a little bit more against the social freedom part. And modern liberals like Democrats tend to support the uh, freedom of uh, political and social uh, expression, but not as much the economic one. All right. But that's a classical liberal. Today, they're kind of like libertarians. Uh, that's how you might know them. All right. Nonetheless, it was a good turnaround uh, back then. So that's what his idea is going to be. So initially, these guys are going to be pro laissez-faire economics, and they're going to be pro universal, or at least male suffrage. I'll put pro universal male suffrage because uh, women are not going to be getting the vote till the early 1900s, like almost 100 years later. All right. So that's what they're going to be. Pro-universal male suffrage, pro-laissez-faire. That's the first part of the 19th century. That's going to change after the 1870s. And I think we kind of remember this from the Panic of 1873, which I thought I mentioned here before. Maybe I haven't. Yeah. We'll not mention it again. But then it'll, some will, will break off. But that's what it's going to be at least till about the 1870s or so. Okay. So they've got to do this, though. They've got to make this actually happen. So to do this... It's going to take a lot of working class people and middle class people because John Stuart Mill himself was middle class. That's why he could like sit there and think and read books and write things because he wasn't a working class person. Um, they're going to move for changing the voting system in England. And they're going to do that in 1832. They formed Mill in 1832 and they change the boroughs in which people were elected into? Whew, got both the questions I was going to ask. Well done. I'll give you a double for that. Yes, uh, they're going to uh, form a lot of support in the form of speeches, rallies, demonstrations uh, for Parliament to pass what's called the Reform Bill or the Reform Act of uh, 1832. And yes, this is a major reform because it opens up voting to a ton of working class people. So it does a couple things. I don't need you to know all the necessary details here, but just know this. I think about almost 500,000, it's like 450,000. 450,000 working class men get the vote. Get the vote. Uh, and they do so in two ways. Number one, they change the boroughs, which are just basically like the districts that they vote representatives from. Like it's a random line they draw. Like they say, oh, this city, this city, this city, and this part of this city vote for a representative, then this part of that town, and this city, and this city, and this city vote for this representative. They changed those. Uh, and they needed to because there were way more working class people in the cities now uh, as opposed to the countryside. So by doing that, they uh, are going to increase uh, greatly the amount of uh, constituents that could vote uh, for working class representatives. And also, they changed the uh, property requirement. 
It used to be you had to own property like an estate to vote. Now it's just if you have a house with a, what the hell do they call it? Those kettle things that they would basically cook, cook and boil water with. It wasn't a cauldron, but I like that you knew that at least. It's actually called something different in England. And it's a little bit different than just a cauldron because it's like partly stone and it's partly permanent. But as long as they have that one thing in that structure, that counts as property. And way more people have that than they have this like lavish estate. So it's gonna really, uh, property requirements gonna be reduced. They're gonna have way more working class people. So immediately I have working class people running for parliament or much more popular, they're voting for representatives that represent them, all right? And this is why very, very quickly we get that series of reforms that we've talked about already before. Uh, can anybody name all three of the changes that they get like right out the gate within 10 years of this reform bill uh, pushing working class constituents in? The Lines Act, Times Act, and the- Yeah, 10 Hours Act. 10, oh, 10 Hours Act, and the Child Act, forgot that one. Child Act, Oh, so close. I'll still give you one. Uh, what you got? Factory Act, the Mines Act, Mines Act. Ten, hours. 10 Hours Act, right. So between 1833 and the 1840s, uh, I get some major, major uh, working class reform. I get, like we mentioned before, I get the Factory Act, Mines Act, which basically just banned child labor in factories uh, and mines, and uh, the Ten Hours Act, which capped the uh, work day at 10 hours, uh, and after that, you know, you have to potentially be paid extra for that rather than being forced to do that. All right, um, why did these come after the Reform Bill of 1832? Somebody explain that one to me if you can. Because before there wasn't working class people inside the government to actually make the laws. Exactly, now for the first time, there's actually working class people that either vote for representatives that support them or have representatives that can go and propose and pass uh, laws and reform. So, it's no longer a middle class monopoly on lawmaking. The working class has a say as well. So that is the Reform Act, and we'll, we'll take a brief break. Let's go to, oh, Chartism, so that's right after this. All right, so since I have a whole bunch of new people uh, getting out into the game, and they are going to be voting for working class type uh, representatives or policies, uh, I'm gonna have the makings of like what are the first political parties. So a political party, if you guys don't know, is basically a group that has like a set of beliefs or an agenda, things that they believe will make life better or their life better or whatever, uh, that they agree on. And they generally tend to vote for similar representatives or policies. All right, so you know, if, I'm, uh, if I agree with mostly liberal policies in the United States, I'm probably gonna be or vote Democrat. If I agree with more uh, libertarian or conservative views, then I'm probably going to view a, or vote a little bit more towards the Republican side or with Republicans. Um, that tendency was kind of started in what's called the Chartist movement. And that got my marker over here. Uh, it's called the Chartist movement. So we didn't initially have what you would call political parties quite yet, uh, because we don't have everybody in politics and they're not they're not used to exactly what to do yet. But we do have a group of people that start. Um, acting together uh, as a large group, a large mass for like a specific objective. All right, uh, what you got? The Ethic Board Law League. Yeah, that's true. I, I want to get more into that, but yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you and have you explain to me how they are to get the, the, the point for that. So yeah. So first of all, let's talk about this Chartism thing. So Chartism, and again, these are kind of like uh, modern political parties. So they are. Uh, co-opted, so multiple people, agendas, uh, and they do so by gathering support and making the representatives think that, oh, if I don't do this, they're not going to vote me in next time. Like, I'm doomed unless I pass this law. All right, so what they're, they're basically just trying to show, look how many people support this, you better vote for it, or you're not going to get reelected next time. That's kind of like the threat, the, the implicated, uh, implied threat. All right, so like, you know, let's say uh, I'm your guys' representative and you really want a specific law changed here at school. Uh, if you all show up and, and demonstrate that you really want this changed and you're not gonna be happy if it's not, I kind of have to vote for it, why? Yeah, otherwise I, I guess it's tricky my job, I won't be voted again, but if you guys want something and I routinely don't deliver, at least with my vote, then uh, I'm not gonna be your representative for much longer. All right, so that's kind of the threat here. So 
they have a, a common goal agenda uh, and they use mechanisms to show how many people support their idea whatever it might be what it might be uh, they use speeches rallies and gather signatures yep them. exactly so speecher, speechers speeches rallies uh, and they have people sign these uh, 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 charts or these uh, these um, uh, agreements essentially showing how many people support this particular view all right uh, so they're gonna sign charters uh, and we're not talking like a few people we're talking thousands of signatures to show hey this this many people support this idea so if I hand this to my representative they're gonna be like Oop, I better vote for this or I ain't gonna be I ain't gonna be here much longer essentially so that's what they try to do they try to show it with physical uh, uh, presence like with the speeches and the rallies uh, or they try to uh, uh, convince their representative that a lot of people support it with signatures or they also uh, may pass out pamphlets and things like that all right and again, it's effective, especially early on, because people are worried, oh, if I don't do this, I'm not gonna be back in Parliament again. All right, that, that's kind of the underlying threat there. All right, so you mentioned uh, the Anti-Corn Law League. That's kind of the first major political group or chartist movement that's really successful in convincing a lot of representatives to make certain laws. Uh, what did the Anti-Corn Law League want? They wanted to get rid of the tariff on grain. Okay, cool. So I have, uh, in the 1840s, I have a series of laws uh, called the Corn Laws. And again, don't forget that corn is uh, an English term just for grain, like it could mean wheat or barley or whatever it might be. All right, so it's a tariff on grains in Great Britain. So if I'm gonna get grain from the United States or Russia or Germany, places where it's cheaper, uh, they're gonna put a tariff on it, so uh, I have to buy British grain, essentially. Make sense, you with me on that? Okay. However, there's something going on in the 1840s that causes a lot of people to want to be able to buy cheap grain. Because, well, you tell me why. The potato famine? Yep, you have potato famine, right? This is called the Hungry 40s. Do you remember how that started? Oh, uh, no. Okay, it was just a blight, it was a disease, essentially. So, we have the Hungry 40s. Uh, and against the potato famine. And this hurt all of Europe, but it especially hurt Great Britain, uh, in particular Ireland. Okay, so this Anti-Corn Law League is going to form, and why do they want to get rid of this uh, corn law? Why do they want to get rid of the corn laws themselves? So they can buy cheap grain to get rid of the, so they can come back from the potato famines? Yeah, or at least not die of starvation, right? So it's not going to save them economically. So we, we do have a lot of particularly Irish people uh, starving to death or moving because their uh, cash crop, potatoes, uh, failed. So we have a huge influx of immigrants coming to the United States in the mid-1800s for this reason. They're escaping poverty and famine. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's not going to solve save their jobs, but at least if they have cheap grain coming in from the United States and Russia and Germany, which have uh, extra, they're going to uh, be able to buy food much more cheaply and, and, and more lives will be saved, right? So to achieve this, they formed the Anti-Corn Law League. And in 1846, they're successful. Uh, the Corn <coughs> Laws are repealed. All right, so what we know about Chartism, uh, what did this charter group, this political group do to uh, show representatives that they needed to get rid of those corn laws. Um, yeah, we'll start with that. Uh, they did uh, speeches, rallies, and like, uh, got signatures? Yep, they got lots of signatures in the charters, exactly right. So uh, that's going to allow them to uh, uh, let representatives know just how important it is to them, and they're going to repeal these corn laws. How is the repealing of the corn laws in 1846, I don't think I put the year, oh, I did. How was that classical liberalism? There's actually two ways it's classical liberalism, but just, yeah, explain how. It allowed for free market uh, trade with politics. Yep, so it's laissez-faire re reduction of tariffs, absolutely. Okay, and how else would this process be classical liberal? Um, seeing what makes uh, the overall population happier. Yep, and they're doing that by uh, uh, through uh, increased representation and suffrage, exactly right. So it's making the largest amount of people ha happy, in this case just not dying. Um, and also it's applying uh, two themes, the equal opportunity voting as well as the laissez-faire economic policy. So you guys with me on that? Okay, cool. Um, 
while this is all going on in the early 19th century, I'm going to erase this now. Any questions about the Corn Laws or Chartists or the Reform Act? Or, okay, good. Because uh, if you understand that, you really actually understand um, liberalism here in the early 19th century. Because I have these views in the early 19th century uh, about progress and, and uh, um, uh, natural rights and equality of opportunity, and equality in general, uh, what institution do you think people are going to start to oppose? And why now? Because this is the first time in history ever that somebody has, a civilization has come out against an institution like this. Because again, this has ex existed in all civilizations for all human history without even a second thought. They just consider it a natural. Why? The government, and uh, they're going to try to be more utilitarian. They're trying to be more, what makes you guys happy, what makes everyone happy. And so. That's true. Um, but I'm talking about a specific yeah. practice that they want to change and or get rid of. You, you, you're right. This is the first time ever they're applying these liberal principles. I, I can't say you're wrong there. Um, they had democracy before, but not with the natural rights attached to it. But um, what's, what's going to be ending here? Um, slavery. slavery, right. Why would they oppose slavery? Because again, let's not forget. Let's not take this for granted. This wasn't like some Western creation and they're, they're evil, extra evil for doing it. No, the entire world had done this. It was evil. Uh, but this is the first time ever in history that somebody said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe people are are equal, and we shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. Uh, so it, it humanized everyone essentially, right? So these views themselves uh, humanized people, even from different cultures and diff with different appear appearances. So they uh, humanized uh, all humans. And if you're going to assume people are the same and have uh, potential and need to have the natural rights protected, uh, slavery is the opposite of that. Right, that's controlling a person like property, mistreating them, not giving them any natural rights or opportunity. Uh, that is the absolute opposite. So uh, the movement to uh, end slavery, so uh, we're going to have early 19th century uh, opposition to slavery. And let's not take for granted that's the first time ever that's happened uh, where a civilization like stopped, reflected on itself and said, no, that's a, that's a bad thing to have. Because again, People didn't think slaves were people before. They thought either they were a lower class or a different race, so they weren't human and had the same abilities or thoughts or feelings that you did. So they had no problem just collecting slaves and misusing them for labor or, or raping them or whatever it might have been. All right, so uh, what is this movement called then is what I'm going for. And uh, how do they actually attack this officially, if you, if you know? Uh, the abolition movement. Yep, it's the abolition movement. And then what do they do in Britain? Um, basically, great Yeah, they do raise awareness against. And you do have that symbol. I forgot the name of the symbol, but there's that symbol like uh, it says something like, uh, "Am I not a brother and a human?" or something like that. Uh, and it's a picture of a slave, and and, and it's accurate. It's, it's true. Okay. Um, does anybody remember specifically how the British get rid of it? Because that's the process that they help spread awareness. But anybody know exactly what the British did to get rid of it? They banned slavery. Yep. And even before that, they banned slavery in the British Empire. So in 1807. They're going to ban uh, internal slavery. So any slaves in the British Empire, it's now illegal. You've got to get rid of them or pay them. Uh, and then they go beyond that. This is, this is the weird one, but good one. They can only make laws about their own country. They can't make laws about other countries. But in 1833, they actually do. They ban the slave trade, like you said. But why is that different than me making it illegal in Great Britain? Yeah, so this means that all slave ships, whether they're Portuguese bringing them over or they're uh, American or uh, South American um, from Brazil or, or, or the Spanish regions or the Caribbean, if they catch you uh, um, moving slaves or possessing slaves, they're going to confiscate them and free them. So in 1833, they go a step beyond banning it in Britain. Uh, they're actually going to ban the slave trade. So they become the world police, kind of. Uh, in enforcing this humanitarian goal. Um, and as much damage as they do in Africa with imperialism, and they do, and we'll talk about it, but uh, as much damage as they do, one of their goals was actually to eliminate slavery uh, in, in Africa and be more humane towards the people. All right, so it was kind of a, a dual pushing of nationalism and exploitation, but they also had this weird enlightenment moral drive to eliminate slavery in Africa, which is where it was most prevalent. In fact, the Arab slave trade 
with Africa started with around 1000 CE. It just ended in, 19, in the 1980s. Like it just stopped happening. I think the last country to make it illegal was in 1981 or something like that. So all the way up to the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, Arabs were still purchasing West African slaves um, from the region, which is ridiculous. All right. Um, and again, that wasn't all Arab nations, but I forget which country did it last, but they, they banned it in 81, I think. So, um, yeah, they go about doing that and banning that, and they're going to extend that to, even when they're imperialist, and it is absolutely abhorrent and exploitative, they are going to try to end slavery and be more humane, except for, of course, uh, one guy uh, who had a, had a colony. Uh, you guys remember him? Leopold, the king, Leopold II. Yeah, Leopold from, uh, from um, uh, Belgium. He's going to try to secretly maintain slavery, brutal slavery, uh, but he does get caught, and the Belgians actually seize his colony and, and they reprimanded for it. But nonetheless, uh, that abolition movement is going to uh, persist. There's another group too that uh, liberals, because this is a this is a liberal phenomenon. This wasn't everybody. Conservatives, so far as I know, people that support monarchy and nobility probably don't care about slavery as much because they still think peasants are supposed to obey them as inferiors. Liberals were what what pushed this. Uh, Enlightenment inspired people. They're also going to take, I guess, the word would be pity. They're also going to take pity on another group of people that seem distraught or um, are, are suffering. Okay, that's largely going to be part of the movement, but who are they going to take pity on, particularly? Jews. The who? Jews. Jews? Yeah, they do a little bit, but not as much, because nationalism is pretty damn strong. Good guess, though. Okay, I, you might not have written these notes yet, but towards, well, starting the early 19th century, more so towards the end, um, are Europeans going to be getting more wealthy or less wealthy? More, more wealthy, right? And as we know, what do middle class families tend to focus on regarding their kids? Education, Education right. So these, uh, it's mostly middle class white women that are doing this. This is a good thing, by the way, is they're trying to uh, help others out that they see as less fortunate. So uh, we already know that they handle the education and raising their kids, but that's not going to be enough for them. In fact, they're going to be done you know, by the time they're teenagers, then what are they going to do after that? Right? They're still alive. They've still got money and time and, and education. What other groups could they extend their help to beyond just their family? Because they do this. They form organizations and they go out and they really try to and do make positive change. Sometimes not positive, but sometimes positive. Yeah, they're specifically going to focus on the working class, uh, and working class kids are a big one. So what we're going to have here, so obviously this is very humanitarian, humanitarian, right, for the good of human beings. Uh, that's going to be more early 19th century. As they get more towards the late 20th century, or 19th century, they're going to focus more on helping the, the urban poor specifically. So uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, uh, female middle class, and Christian too, somebody mentioned that, uh, they feel like it's part of their uh, Christian morality to try to help out the less fortunate on her, uh, largely Christian as well. They're going to uh, aid the uh, poor, the poor classes and the people within them. So you guys already know this, by the way. Most countries in the 18th, 19th century don't have public education. So... Middle class kids get educated by their, their mothers, right? And their family or tutors, whoever they hire. Working class kids got nobody. So these middle class women actually get together and form organizations uh, that are able to educate working class kids. What is that movement called? I could have sworn I told you this before. Apparently I didn't. Education movement? Good guess. Okay, let's think about this. Hold on. You guys could probably tell me. I could have sworn I told you this. Maybe I didn't. All right. Um, working class kids, um, 19th century, when are they working? All day. All day? Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, there's one day most of them don't work. Sunday. 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 Oh. Yes, the Sunday school movement. Yeah, it starts out not as like this fun youth group thing where you screw around while the adults do other things. Uh, it's uh, going to be one where they actually learn school. Like, it's like these working class kids work the six days a week at the factory or whatever, uh, or at home, and then they are at on Sundays they actually go to Sunday school, which is where they learn to like read and write and things like that. So you have the Sunday school movement, not as uh, enjoyable as the contemporary form of Sunday school, 
I, I was raised by a Christian family, so our Sunday school is basically just screw around for like an hour, hour and a half while the parents are doing church things. Um, but this was more serious, obviously. Okay. Um, they also are going to form a lot of private charities. Uh, is there a lot of government aid going out to um, lower class families? And, and why not? You're all right in saying no. Why not, though? It's 19th century. Why not? Because they were uh, able to make laws. Yeah, they weren't able to make laws yet, at least, that extended the state into the economy, right? Because they were still pretty much pro laissez faire. They might, they start putting on some tariffs, like we'll talk about shortly, but they're not ready to start handing out, you know, unemployment checks and disability checks and stuff like that. That's early 20th century, uh, even 1880s in Germany. All right, so we got private charities. You guys ever heard of the Salvation Army? Yeah. Started in the late 19th century by uh, middle class folks. So Salvation Army's one. That's a US one, but it works. All right. Um, they're also going to help out, well, this one doesn't quite help out as much as they planned. One problem for working class families, this happened to the Russians too during the, the Soviet era, is a high rate of consumption of uh, alcohol. alcohol, right. I've actually told you this why. I think I think I give a little psychological tone to it. There's a reason, this is an AP psychology topic, why <coughs> alcoholism is so popular among poor classes or people that have to endure things like the Soviet Union. Why? It helps you forget about the consequences. No, nope, you'll forget about it. You you know exactly what the consequences are. Ah, oh, so close. You don't care. You just don't care about the consequences, right? You are fully aware of it, right? Anytime that they pull somebody over uh, for a DUI or somebody gets into a violent altercation uh, or, or, or any sort of violent crime, when they talk to them, the people are fully aware of what they did and what the consequences are. Now, they might forget later uh, because it does also inhibit your, your memory processing. So that's what they call a blackout when they don't remember what happened the previous day or whatever. But when you're in that moment, you could ask them, is it okay to drink and drive? No. What happens if you do? You go to jail. They know, but they just don't care. They do it anyway. Exactly. So uh, anytime, uh, and you can use this to escape, or some people do anyway, use this to escape things that are upsetting, right? So that was ignoring consequences for crimes. If I'm upset though, or anxious that I'm going to not have enough money, or that I have to work too much, or I feel exhausted, or maybe in the case of the Soviets, my government's oppressive, and I'm constantly fearing being sent off to the gulags. Um, what what happens if I if I uh, get myself uh, wasted all the time? You don't don't care. Yeah, you don't care. You don't have those anxieties. Like you know that they're there, but you just don't care about it. So you don't feel anxious and stressed and all of that. And I'm not saying that's healthy. It's not. Um, you're much more likely to do stupid things. Your judgment's impaired. Your memory's worse. Um, it'll damage your liver, it damages your brain cell, it's all kinds of bad. But in that moment though, you don't care about whatever's bothering you. So there's uh, what's called the temperance movement. Uh, and that's just a way of saying they tried to ban alcohol. Sometimes they did ban alcohol. Uh, and they would do this kind of extremely, like they would go and do these uh, demonstrations and sit-ins where like these women would go outside of bars and. And, and just sit there uh, trying to block the entrance or, or get people to stop drinking. And they were not nice. The people were not nice to them. They would like dump their drinks, drinks on them and spit on them and kick them and stuff like that. So it wasn't pretty. Uh, but they were successful in some areas of either banning alcohol altogether, like you guys ever heard of the, the 18th Amendment to the United States, prohibition? Like they banned alcohol for, I don't know exactly how many years it was, but uh, it was uh, the 1920s, really 30s. You couldn't legally buy or consume alcohol in the United States. It was illegal. It didn't do anything, by the way. People just made it secretly, and it, it, it essentially uh, financed organized crime and the mafia. But uh, they did ban it, uh, and a lot of it was part of this temperance movement. So dry counties are counties that either don't have alcohol for sale or you can't buy it on Sundays, uh, and they were instrumental in getting that accomplished. Who are they trying to help out, though? Working the working class, right. Uh, and they thought that alcohol was bad for primarily two reasons. Number one, it spoiled the small amount of money the working class was getting. That's what they argued. 
And also, they argued it was increasing violence. And we know it does that too, by the way. Uh, it makes you more likely to be violent or aggressive. So, because you don't care about the consequences, right? I'm much more likely if I'm some overworked middle working class guy to hit my kid or my wife if I'm drunk than if I'm not drunk. So, it increases uh, violence and waste wages. That was their argument, at least. But we know it's a disaster when you try to ban something that a bunch of people want. It, it just is. It's like the war on drugs. It just, it just doesn't work. Uh, it just wastes a bunch of time, resources, money, and puts a bunch of people in prison for much longer than they should ever have to be. All right. Um, but yeah, that's kind of their overall goal here is they want to help out uh, what are called the deserving poor. I forgot to mention that. And the deserving poor to them are women, old people, sick people, and kids. Not men, though. They believe men should just man up and get it done. So deserving poor. Okay, so do we understand how the Enlightenment inspired people to uh, expand their empathy to uh, banning slaves and slavery, as well as trying to help out the less fortunate when they had the time and money? Do we at least understand that sort of sequence of events? So why, why do they not want slavery all of a sudden? Because it's dehumanizing, right? What about the Enlightenment is against slavery? Natural, Natural rights, rights, equality, exactly. Why are they helping out these uh, <coughs> deserving poor in the late 19th century? Uh, the that's laws. That doesn't have to do with... Th these, are, these are people doing stuff on their own. Why? Okay, they got more time and money, right? The middle class is bigger, it's wealthier, and uh, I'm sure a lot of these women were, were, were busy... Uh, raising their kids or, or educating them before, but once those kids grow up, what are they going to do now? So they would go out and uh, proactively uh, try to help out the poor through charity work or Sunday school, teach working class kids stuff, or uh, banning alcohol. Okay, last topic I want to talk about is we have a new identity for this working class because they have a lot more rights and they have a lot more, what's the word I'm looking for? Not significance, impact, power, representation, something that is all those words put together. Influence. There we go. That's what we're looking for. They have a lot more influence, and that is the working class. All right, so from the 1830s onward uh, till probably about the 1880s or 1890s, there's a slowly developing identity for this working class. We already know their conditions, right? They, uh, bad pay, dangerous jobs, um, what else? The government's generally working against them, right? Banning strikes and things like that because they're the middle class for the most part. But they do start forming an identity after this Reform Bill Act. Um, so what I have is the, first of all, the formation of working class parties, particularly in two places, Great Britain, and Germany. Why these two places? And why after the 1830s and in the 1880s? Why those two time periods? Uh, they're both industrialized. Okay, yeah, they're both industrialized. Obviously, we need that to happen to have a working class. That's actually a, an obvious but, uh, but, but um, necessary element to that. They both have representation? They do. How? The Great Britain, uh, the Parliament, with their male suffrage. Yep, with the Reform Act of 1832. And what about the, the Germans? They got... I'll, I'll give you that one for sure, because that's a great answer. Why the Germans, though? How come they have representation? That's a tougher one. I'm glad you know that, though. You're right. It's because they have representation. So Great Britain, after the uh, Reform Act, they've got working class uh, constituents, so they get some uh, uh, laws passed. Uh, like in the Reichstag, with the Reichstag, Reichstag, yes. That's kind of like the parliament for Germany. They do have regular people in there, including working class people, or at least people can vote for it. So because of my Reform Act of 1832 and the Reichstag representation uh, after 1871, obviously when Germany was formed, uh, I get two, one for each, uh, working class political parties. Right, that just like, I've erased it, just like the Chartists, they can all work together for a common goal and uh, use methods like rallies and speeches and things like that uh, and charters to gain awareness and, and get things done. 
They actually still exist today. Does anybody know what either of the two parties are? Had the British Labour Party. Yep, and British Labour Party. Germany has the German Social Democratic Party. Excellent. Yep, British Labour Party, and he still exists today. British Labour Party and the uh, German Social Democratic Party. Both those are working class parties. I'm gonna give you one for each. That's that's uh, that's a tough one. Cool. And both of those are going to be very very influential in getting. Um, laws passed that are going to help the working class out. You already know some of them. The 1880s, those reforms by Bismarck, it wasn't because he was a nice guy who loved the working class. Why did he pass those reforms? So he can be elected. He was already elected. Did he realize that um, he needed to make change so that he wasn't overthrown? Yes, he was afraid that these guys would overthrow him. Why was he so afraid after, in 1880, that they were going to overthrow him, though? Okay, I can't say you're wrong about that. Fair enough, I'll give you that. But like, why particularly after, well, I'm not gonna be exact here. Why, why after the mid 19th century are people like Bismarck so much more afraid or wary of this working class and their potential influence? Because they saw a lot of previous monarchs overthrown for not appeasing the working class. Yep, so revolutions of 1848, a lot of uh, uh, governments got overthrown, and in 1830, because they weren't supporting the working class, particularly 48. And what else happened in 48 that uh, made this working class a little bit more what you call volatile, like possibly could rise up and cause issues? The Communist Manifesto. Yeah, a Communist Manifesto, like put together a series of like, hey, rise up violently, take the means of production, then overthrow and, and control the government. Like that's, that's kind of, uh, um, that's in the back of the minds of a lot of these leaders, right? So 1880s, you get some reforms like uh, accident insurance, pensions, and you also get some in 19, uh, what is it, 11 and 13 or something like that. Let's we'll say 1911. In Britain, you're gonna get uh, the same idea of pension and also, um, Unemployment insurance. So if you lose your job for whatever reason, you will temporarily at least uh, get money from the government while you're looking for another job, so long as you're actively trying to look for another job. I don't know the duration. I know for right now, the United States, about the max you can do is two years, and you have to show that you're attempting to find a job, like you have to show the applications you've submitted and, and all of that. You could lie about it, I suppose, but not many people do because it's a really low amount of money. So it's enough to not die off of, but you ain't gonna live lavishly uh, by doing that. So that's the working class identity. The last thing I wanna say about this is before they get this, they actually had a pretty ingenious way of helping each other out. So did I have workers insurance uh, if I got hurt on the job or I got sick uh, back in the 19th century? No, I was on my own. So, and this was smart. What they did was they would form these things called mutual aid societies, these working class people. Mutual aid societies. Obviously these are gone now because now we have disability uh, insurance and workers' compensation, things like that. But this was pretty smart. They would basically take parts of their checks or payment and they would put them all into like a common fund, like a pool of money. So if one of those workers that was contributing, and this, is, this isn't the government or the, the business, this is the people, the workers themselves, they would put this money into like, I don't know, a bank account or whatever, so that if one of them ended up getting hurt or disabled or sick, guess what they get paid from? Mutual aid. Yeah, the mutual aid uh, sum or lump of money, right? Uh, and they would do that. And uh, I'm sure they were much more keen to people exploiting it and be like, oh, no, I, I, I hurt myself at the factory and I can't work for whatever. I'm sure they were aware of that because they're actually paying directly into it. But that did help uh, provide some uh, relief for the working class. All right, tomorrow we'll talk about... Um, the free trade changes after the 1870s, Marxism and anarchism and Zionism. So yesterday, yesterday, yesterday we talked about liberalism throughout the 20th century. So we noted how it was uh, at the beginning, very enlightenment inspired, and it's gonna continue to be, but there's gonna be a divergence at the end. So as far as individual liberty goes, like what you can do in society politically, uh, liberalism is pretty consistent that they believe in enlightenment ideals of equality and uh, equal opportunity, things like that. But they do different, differ economically. What do uh, early 19th century liberals believe in economically?
the classical liberals. Lousy fair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They want uh, low or no government intervention. So would those early classical liberals like state pensions and workers' insurance or uh, accident insurance? No, they wouldn't necessarily like that, right? But a good chunk of people start to split in the late 19th century. So they're still liberals, but they're... In the United States, they're known as progressives, like the progressive era, where they come in and they want to make some economic changes, and most of them end up being pretty good. Um, so uh, um, that's where you kind of have this breakaway or this split between the two. So what was a classical liberal in the uh, early 19th century sort of transitions into two different movements that are kind of now what we see today. So now, a lot of the economic views are classical liberal, uh, for like conservative Republicans, and now a lot of the uh, economic uh, views for um, more protection-based, intervention-based, like government and the economy-based uh, views are what are like progressive or liberal uh, Democrats nowadays. Uh, and that's, this is kind of where that bridge or that break starts to occur in the late 19th, early 20th, early 20th century. All right, who are my conservatives, by the way, in the 19th century for the most part? Because liberals are not the conservatives, they're the ones that are going for the change. Uh, but they do end up splitting at the late 19th, early 20th century. Who were the conservatives before that by the 20th century comes around, they're totally gone, like completely gone? Middle class? Uh, no, not the middle class. Good guess, though. The middle class is comprised of both. The conservatives. Leaders. The leaders. What leaders? Uh, like the... So what I mean by conservative are these are people that thought traditional authorities should be the authorities, and, and uh, whether they were themselves, they supported it. Those were the conservatives. Um, like, do you mean, like, a specific person? Yeah, liberals want to change, want laissez-faire policies and then later protectionism, and they want equal opportunity liberty. Who did the conservatives back then, what did they believe? The monarchy. Yes, they were all about the monarchy, the nobility, and perhaps the church, right, having authority. Do we see any people advocating that stuff today? No, no. no it's pretty much extinct, right? Now uh, we've, like you said, sort of... Uh, polarize that, that split that start ha starts happening with liberals in the late 19th, early 20th century where some want to stay out of the economy with the government and some want to increase the amount of government in the economy. That's, this is kind of where it begins. All right, so uh, we're going to say uh, late 19th century uh, liberal split or transition, I should say. All right, so those that are going to keep those classical liberal views of free, uh, maximum freedom in the economy with no government intervention, as well as maximum social um, liberty, those are going to be what start to become conservatives. And the ones that start to become progressives are ones that advocate more state being involved in the economy, like breaking up monopolies and stopping cronyism and regulating factories so that uh, you know the food's edible and people are relatively safe, things like that. All right. One of the things that's going to start setting people off um, as far as opposing laissez-faire policies, liberals I'm talking about, is uh, a, a whole bunch of uh, what we call panics, economic panics, in the uh, 19th century. Now, we, we, do, we do briefly talk here about a specific one in 1873, but like, what's, a, what's a panic, essentially? Like, what's going on here? And, yeah, we'll just start with that. What is a panic? It's basically like a... Go ahead. It's basically almost like it's a recession. So, um, so the economy is it? The economy is doing well during this time. Okay. All right. So it, it is going to be a period here, at least after the panic, where you have a recession, which means your economy doesn't grow as much or not at all. In case of a recession, it doesn't grow uh, for at least one uh, or two consecutive quarters. Can't remember. I think it's one consecutive. Uh, depression is like when it's really severe. But yeah, so we do generally have a, a recession for a few years. In fact, the Panic of 1870, there's like a 10-year recession, which is pretty nasty. But what's what's causing these panics? Why do they get the name panic is what I'm going for. So you're not wrong, and I'll give you give you credit for that because it does start a recession. What is it? Because uh, when like, the thing to like, the stock market like, crashes, then people like, get all freaked out, and then they started bringing all their money from like, all the banks. Yes, we have what's called a run on banks. So anything can happen. It could be a famine, it could be a stock market failure, it could be a, a new set of tariffs or war, whatever it might be. Something happens so people stop spending. And then people uh, uh, become afraid uh, that they're gonna lose their money in the stock market or whatever uh, because certain small banks start going bankrupt. And back then, 
What would happen if uh, my bank went bankrupt, I had money in it? It default, it's just gone, poof, there it is. So when you start seeing these small little bank failures because of like a stock market crash or some sort of uh, other error in the, in the investment uh, financial market or a war is going on, whatever it might be, um, people get scared so they run to take their money out before their bank goes under, right? Those are the panics. So it's like a run on banks, then more banks go under and now there's less uh, banks out there holding people's money or giving out loans, so the economy slows and that's why we have this recession. So the Great Depression, when we get to that a little bit later, it's just that on a massive scale, essentially. Uh, so these little panics are like little mini Great Depressions constantly happening. Uh, there's one in particular that's really a lot more devastating than, than most. It's, it's a 10-year recession, and uh, like you mentioned, uh, where, where you have this economic negative growth or stagnation, uh, and that's gonna be the Panic of uh, 1873. This one leaves a sour taste and in the mouths of a lot of Europeans. Uh, it's a 10 year um, uh, recession. And it's gonna be initiated because of a uh, stock market. And then of course, bank failure in Austria. So what happens is the financial uh, market in Austria tanks temporarily, some banks go under, and that the impact is gonna be that's going to uh, echo and resonate through the other economies of the surrounding countries of Germany uh, and then Italy, as well as France and even into the, uh, the, the British economy. So um, why are they getting angry at free trade? Because here's where they start to get upset with these laissez-faire free trade policies. All right, and again, if you're wondering why, when there is free trade and you can buy and sell from different countries and one has an economic blunder like this, that means they're going to buy a lot less from you, so your business suffers too. So, boom, Austria fails, buys less stuff, that hurts all of the economies around it and maybe causes recessions there as well. So like, why are they mad at free trade exactly? What you got? They're mad at free trade because um, certain industries in their own economy became dependent on the foreign economy. Mm -hmm. Once that collapsed, they didn't have supplies to meet their own domestic industry. That's a perfect answer, yeah. So. If I'm engaging in free trade and let's say uh, uh, Austria buys a lot of, I don't know, coal from Germany, all right? I've got a, a low tariff or free trade, so I'm really dependent on that Austrian business for coal. So here they are buying a lot of my stuff. Boom, their economy crashes because of some stock market banking error, right? And now they're buying a lot less coal. What happens to me now in Germany? Make less money, which industry specifically? Coal. coal, right. So depending on the industry maybe, or even the economy, but certainly the industry, um, some other country screwing up is going to affect my economy. So if this coal industry slows down in Germany, coal workers get laid off, they start spending less money in the German economy, then the other businesses suffer as well. So it's this weird domino effect uh, that upsets people. So what are people's solutions then when, when this starts happening? Uh, um, they start opposing free trade, right? Because it connects to various industries and can echo in their economy. What's their response here in the 1870s and 80s and on? They want more domestic trade instead of uh, outside foreign. How do you encourage that or discourage foreign uh, trade? Tariffs. Tariffs, right. So um, they are, of course, upset uh, at local, or actually domestic, domestic uh, economic interruption. Like we said, the made up example of the German coal industry, they're mad if, if Austria is uh, buying or trading for a lot of their coal because they lose coal miners, all right, when, when more, uh, they lay off miners. And then of course that reduces the amount of money in the German economy, which reduces the overall business there and maybe some bus German businesses go under. So uh, they, they're upset about this interruption. So the, uh, the new strategy becomes imposing select uh, tariffs uh, on certain goods. So that way, the economy is much more focused on domestic purchases. So if Austria screws up, I'm much less likely to care in Germany because most of my business comes from Germans buying coal, not Austrians. So if they screw up their economy, it doesn't hurt me as much. At least that's the logic that they have behind it. So uh, the, um, the idea here is a uh, return to select tariffs. Right? What's that called? Just say it if you know it. Protectionism, right. And the idea here is I'm trying to protect my own industry from uh, 
these uh, catastrophes spreading to other economies that are interconnected with uh, free trade. Okay, um, so they don't go full tariff like mercantilists where we, we only buy our own stuff and we now are trying to steal stuff from other countries. Like that'd be straight mercantilism, like an economic nationalism type thing. Um, but there are some. So who comes up with this idea starting in Germany where I would want to put up some tariffs to sort of bolster myself, at least attempt to bolster myself from these uh, situations from occurring. So who is he and what's the name of his uh, idea? Was it the Frederick State system? Yes, not the state system, it's the national system, right. So uh, a proponent of this is uh, Friedrich Liszt, and he catches the ear of Bismarck. He develops what's called the national system. And it's exactly what I just described. It's select tariffs. to protect uh, domestic industry, right? They know that, that increased world trade is better overall, but they do want to put some tariffs, not just be totally free trade. And all the mishaps of other economies uh, hit me right in the gut, essentially, is their, their idea or what they're trying to avoid. Okay, give me an example of a uh, reversal of some free trade policies that we have. Tariff agreement of 1879. What's that do? That uh, were Bismarck bans, uh, ter tariffs, foreign grade. Yep, Bismarck convinces the Reichstag and the Emperor uh, to uh, enact the tariff agreement of 1879. And uh, all that really does is uh, imposes a uh, tariff on foreign grain. Particularly uh, from Russia, who's right next to them, uh, and even so, the night, more so Russia, but the United States too. Uh, and he's trying to protect those uh, Prussian um, uh, grain harvesters and farmers, essentially, is what they're trying to do there. All right, and there are a lot. And this is going to build, this is going to continue all the way till, well, World War II, really. Uh, and it's, these tariffs are only going to increase in number uh, during and following World War I, uh, during the interwar period when no one knows what the hell to do during the Depression. And then after World War II is when it's finally going to change, and we, we have a lot more free trade policies that are actually most of which are still in place. They've been in place for over 70 years, and they've worked well. Uh, but this is a return to protectionism, and this is where liberals start to uh, break away uh, as far as split on their opinions of economic theory. All right, so this transition represents how some liberals including John Stuart Mill himself, by the way, began to advocate um, state <coughs> intervention in the economy. We've actually seen some already getting voted in. Do we have some examples of the government coming in and telling businesses what they can and can't do, or raising taxes, or applying tariffs, anything like that at all? None whatsoever? We haven't learned any in the 19th century? The corn laws. That's taking them away, so that would be the opposite. Oh wait, you mean putting them in place. Okay, fair enough, yeah. The presence of those corn laws would be an example of, of intervention, yeah, and protectionism, cool. Repealing them would not be, right, but correct. The corn laws would, what else? The mines and factory acts. Yeah, all those mines and factory acts. I realize people voted for them and they were certainly necessary, but is that an example of the government telling companies what they can and can't do? Yeah, that's intervention. What else? You can't just act ten hours after I don't know what that sound was. <laughs> you can't just act ten hours after Yeah, all, all of those like Mines Act, Factory Act, Ten Hours Act. What else though? So anytime I'm telling a factory what they can and can't do to their workers or who they can and can't hire. Take it to a pension? Yep, state pensions when you're requiring businesses or people to pay into a state pension and, and paying them out, yep. Yep, accident insurance, requiring businesses uh, uh, or, or using state tax money to, to provide for uh, work insurance. Unemployment, all those are examples of intervention, and that's going to increase all the way till about the mid-20th century. We'll talk about that later when we talk about, like, the welfare state. Okay, what you got? Oh, yeah, just put it there. Okay, uh, so that's kind of the shift, and we'll talk more about this when we get into the uh, to period four. Uh, we start talking about, like, Keynesian economics, uh, and the Great Depression and the welfare state. But this is when it starts, 
where liberals are starting to break on their opinion of um, you know, what the government should and shouldn't do in the economy. And again, those that say, no, no, stay pro laissez faire as much as possible, those are kind of what modern conservatives sort of believe economically. And those that are more pro uh, state intervention are more so what liberal slash Democrats are um, siding with nowadays, if that makes sense. Okay, any questions about the liberal shift? Sweet. <laughs>